Well, good morning. I welcome members to the 32nd meeting in 2014 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And as always, ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that we take item six in private. This will allow for further consideration of the oral evidence, which we're just about to receive on the EU opt-out. Does the committee agree to take item six in private, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two is the aforementioned EU opt-out. And we have the opportunity to take oral evidence from Scottish Government officials. So I welcome Neil Watt, Head of EU Implementation, Neil Robertson, EU Policy Manager, Fraser Goff, Assistant Scottish Parliamentary Council, and Catherine, did I say Fraser Goff? I, sorry, I think I misread that. It's Catherine Scott, Lawyer Directorate for Legal Services. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, I understand Neil Watt might want to make an opening statement, which might forestall other, some of our questions. So other Neil. Thank you. Yogurt, so. All right, Mr. <laughs> Robertson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The measures that we are here today to discuss are included in a batch of 35 the UK intends to opt into on the 1st of December. The UK government announced it would exercise the opt-out of all justice and home affairs measures in October 2012, and this was confirmed in July 2013. In July of this year, the UK Government confirmed to the Scottish Government the final list of 35 measures that would be included in the package of measures the UK would opt back into on 1st December 2014. On the 6th of November this year, Spain lifted its block on the UK rejoining these measures. And on the 10th of November, the Commons debated and voted on the UK Government approach to transposing the remaining 11 of these 35 measures into UK law. Following the affirmative vote in the Lords yesterday, we understand that the UK will shortly confirm their wish to participate in the agreed package of 35 measures. And assuming the Council and the Commission agree the necessary procedural arrangements, the opt-in will take place on 1st December. There are two EU framework decisions subject to the UK opt-in for which we are taking a Scotland-only approach to the implementation. These are the instruments we are before the Committee to discussed today. Despite the uncertainty around the opt-in, we have tried to keep the committee updated on all measures in which we are participating. The first of these SSIs transposes the requirements of the trials and absentia framework decision. This amends the original mutual recognition of financial penalties framework decision. Transposition of the trials and absentia framework decision will help continue to ensure consistency in the way financial penalties operate across the EU and make sure Scotland is not seen as an attractive destination for criminals, confident their fines won't follow them here. It will do this by clarifying the circumstances in which a financial penalty imposed in a person's absence can be recognised and executed in another member state. The provisions safeguard and accused rights, ensuring that the correct procedures have been followed in a trial and absence before a request to process a financial penalty from another member state can be accepted. They will also help ensure criminals are not able to evade justice by arguing that it was unfair to impose a fine in their absence. Moving on to the second SSI, the Mutual Recognition of Supervision Measures Framework decision sets up a system for mutual recognition of bail across the EU, colloquially known as the European Supervision Order, the ESO for short. It will help ensure that a decision on bail taken by a judicial authority in one member state can be recognised and enforced in another. The aim is to allow an accused person to return home to be supervised there until a trial takes place in the member state where the offence took place. It will also allow persons awaiting trial in their home country to move to another EU country while on bail, for example, to take up work. By implementing this measure, Scots awaiting trial abroad will be able to return home and continue with their normal home life, work or study until their trial actually starts. EU citizens, potentially being held in Scottish prisons, will also be able to return to their home member state. And looking at it from another angle, persons on bail awaiting trial in their home country will be able to take advantage of work opportunities in another EU country. Implementation of these framework decisions supports the Scottish Government's purpose and vision for a safer and stronger Scotland where an individual's rights are supported. As the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has indicated in recent correspondence with the Committee, only once the UK opts back into the third pillar pre-Lisbon Treaty Justice and Home Affairs decisions do we have the necessary vivies to transpose these framework decisions. 
We are using power conferred by Section 22 of the European Communities Act 1972, which enables ministers to make provision by way of SSIs subject to negative procedure, which will be laid and come into force on the 1st of December. We appreciate that this will mean that the SSIs are not subject to the usual 28-day scrutiny period by the Parliament. This is an inevitable consequence of the opt-out, opt-in process, which means that ministers only obtain the values to make these two SSIs on the very day they have to come into force. As he mentioned in correspondence with the committee, the Cabinet Secretary was particularly keen to factor in the views of the Scottish Parliament on the procedural options available for making the necessary transpositions instruments and to enable the fullest possible scrutiny. We thank the committee for their understanding and cooperation in agreeing to scrutinise drafts of the instruments in advance of 1st December. I hope you find this helpful background and the team are happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Very grateful to you, Mr Robertson. Uh, you'll appreciate that the policy of this is not actually what we are here to cover, uh, but we certainly need to look at the process and I think our questions will be started by John Scott, please. Thank you very much, convener. <coughs> and um, <coughs> could you, I just ask you to put it in words of one syllable, if you like, as to why it would not be possible to make these instruments before the 1st of December. Uh, I should answer that. Um, we're using Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act. Um, that only allows us to um, make uh, instruments to implement EU obligations. Now, these uh, framework decisions, they won't become EU obligations until the 1st of December. So we only get the power on the 1st of December. It's, it's due to a transitional arrangement that was put in place when the Lisbon Treaty came in five years ago. Right. Pursue that, though, and I'll bring Stuart in afterwards, because whilst I understand that may be the plain meaning of the words, which I've had a look at, uh, there is a tendency to believe that we can't see a train coming down a track, and because it's not in the station, the train doesn't exist and it's not going to arrive on time. Could it not reasonably be argued that because we can see an obligation coming, it's an obligation? Could we not have brought this forward by affirmative procedure on the basis that we could see the obligation would be there? Well, that, that, was, that was an approach that, that, that we discussed um, uh, with, with Parliament officials. Um, we, we thought there might be an argument for bringing forward an affirmative instrument, um, and, and that was something that was mentioned, that was an option that was mentioned in correspondence uh, with the committee. Um, that was something we were sort of willing to do, but as it happened, I think the feedback that we got from yourselves was that the preferred route would be uh, using a negative instrument. So, so that's what we've we've done. I, I don't wish to disagree with you. I mean, I signed the letter that said as much, so I, I'm not trying to reverse that. But I'm just interested to know whether there is a a school of legal thought, if you like, that recognises that an obligation which hasn't crystallised plainly is going to, and therefore the objection to using the affirmative procedure may be more in our minds than in legal reality. I, th I think there is an argument that, um, that, that it would have been possible to do it um, by um, uh, laying an affirmative instrument ahead of, of uh, the, the, the ministers obtaining the varies to make the instrument. That's on one reading of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Act. Um, but, you know, e equally I can see the, the view that would, would go otherwise and perhaps it's uh, to be on the safe side. Uh, we, we've done it this way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stuart, first. Um, I just wanted to briefly explore the question of lacuna. In other words, what time, you know, what minute does this all happen at? In other words, does the power become available when the clock passes midnight between the 30th of November and the 1st of December. That's the precise time. Is that correct? I'll, I'll, I'll go first at that. Um, I think, I mean, in terms of what happens next, I mean, there was, there was the vote in the, the Lords last night, so that, that sort of removes all the sort of UK parliamentary obstacles to us, UK member state, confirming that we wish to opt back into these measures. 
the Commission and the Council then obviously need to agree the sort of necessary procedural uh, uh, sort of necessities. We're not, I, I don't as yet have all the detail on how that works in practice, but we understand that the Commission will confirm that the UK opt in has, uh, uh, will take place on these, uh, for these measures at or around midnight on the 30th of November, and, uh, and that will be confirmed in the official journal. Specifically, there is no gap. That, I mean, that's the essence of my question. As soon as they're published in the journal, which will be a presumably synchronised to take place at midnight, they will have effect. And at that point, they'll be subject to the jurisdiction of the ECJ. But given the, the capacity of officials and ministers here, there is a momentary gap in our provision. I, I, I don't think that needs to be the case. I mean, I, it, it doesn't need to be the case, but it's something that, that, that we might consider doing in the drafting is that um, basically there's a legal principle that if a, a minister sort of signs an instrument at any time on a certain day, that instrument is, is then valid for the whole day. So it goes back to a sort of second after midnight the night before. Now, you could say that, that there's an element of kind of retrospection there, possibly. Um, and in some cases, if there's any question over that, then a time can be put on an instrument that, that, that is valid from, you know, the, the time that the minister signs it on the day. But I'm not sure that's actually necessary in this case. Well, I, I, I just wanted to see if there were gaps. That, that, that's really all I'm interested in <coughs> in this little question. If I'm allowed, uh, convener, a sort of non-legal sort of answer to that question as well, which is... I think there is, you know, some understanding at European and institution and member state level that this, these are quite unique circumstances and the transitional measures have been discussed. And, I, you know, I, I think there, the risks of this happening are, are very, very small. You know, that, that would be my sort of non-legal answer to that question. The concern, though, is given that we're talking about criminal areas uh, and therefore lawyers tend to, quite rightly, worry about the detail. Um, is, is simply one of continuity uh, and, the, and the risk, as it were, perceived by us that somebody might uh, be let out of prison and, and in, indeed maybe find procedural ways of getting away from very significant charges simply because there was at least conceptually some discontinuity in the provisions under which they were held. I, I, th I think what Catherine Scott has suggested indicates to me that there is a principle of continuity which recognises a signature during a day takes you back to midnight and if that continuity is recognised in European law then we would appear to have explored the issue. Yeah, thank you. Stuart, did you? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Robertson, in your, opening comments, <coughs> excuse me, in your opening comments you mentioned about uh, on the date of the 6th of November uh, when Spain lifted uh, their block. Um, now, if that had have happened sooner would that have had an effect upon which type of instrument could have been laid here in, in the Scottish Parliament, whether it's going to be a, a positive or a negative? No, because we would still have to wait until the 1st of December when the UK opted back in to actually have the, the vivis to make these instruments. So as, uh, as uh, Ms Scott said, um, um, we didn't take the affirmative approach, we took the negative approach, so that would have had no impact on the decision. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. John, do you, have we? Well, I was just going to ask, um, mistakes happen everywhere and all over. What would actually be the implications um, of the commencement date on the 1st of it, um, December? Um, not commencing the in instruments on that date, what would the implications be? I think I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, contingency measures are being discussed in Brussels, and, and I don't as yet know whether that, that uh, uh, an agreement has been reached. And I can I can update the committee once I've sort of picked up the issue with UK colleagues. But I understand there'll be a a sort of um, a period of seven days to, for exactly that reason to make sure there's no chance of any operational gaps to to make sure they can uh, uh, you know agree all the procedural arrangements and also, obviously also to cover any you know, other events that might or conceivably could happen. Okay. Uh, slightly. And, um, 
not entirely clear, but if you just explain to me again why the draft order and regulations are considered to be enabled by the powers in Section 2.2 of the 1972 Act to implement the EU obligations. Can you, can you just explain that for the record for us? Perhaps again, if you've already done so, but um, section, make it clear to me. Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972, it's, it's a sort of general enabling power, enabling ministers in the UK to implement EU obligations and they, they, they can do that through statutory instruments either using an affirmative procedure or a negative procedure. So it's a general catch-all enabling power and that's quite useful in such situations like that the current with the current instruments we don't have a domestic enabling power that we can readily use to implement these, these particular measures because they're kind of new and, and novel. Um, so that section 2.2 power is, is, is very valuable in, in this case. Um. I see. Okay. Just to follow that up, 2.2, two, two, yes, does specifically say that any designated minister or department may make such an order. Um, are we entirely clear that, given the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government wasn't even a twinkle in anyone's eye in 1972, well, with a few exceptions perhaps, but certainly legally didn't exist, are we, are we absolutely clear that Scottish ministers are designated ministers in the context, please? Yes. Under what power? Well, it's, it's a designation that's made uh, under, under that power, under Section 2.2, there is a designation made. As well. Presumably the Scotland Act, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, does that take us to Stuart? It does. Stuart? Is it? I don't want I thought there might have been. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm actually not sure whether we need to cover back six. Are you comfortable that we've done six? In fact, probably seven as well. Yep, okay. Right, thank you for your forbearance. I think you've covered off most of what we were interested in. I'm wondering whether I could look, though, at the regulations uh, specific. Yes, I'm, I'm, John, do you want to? Well, no, one on you go. Okay, right. thank you. All right, in which case, we've, we've got to the same place. Forgive us for the choreography. Um, I noticed that this is, these are freestanding regulations rather than ones that are brought through as an amendment to Part 3 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act of 1995. And I wonder if you could explain why you've taken that particular route, please. Happy to field this one. Um, I suppose there are a few reasons. One is the 1995 Act, Criminal Procedure Act, is already heavily overladen with material um, and somewhat groaning under the pressure of it. It's not an easily navigable statute anymore. So there's no real attraction in cramming yet more into it. It doesn't help anybody. This is a very standalone procedure. As far as the outgoing requests to other states to recognise Scottish bail, it obviously is a tie into our bail arrangements in the 1995 Act. But insofar as it deals with the incoming requests from other states, it concerns people who are not accused of any crime in Scotland. And therefore, to even put it into the criminal procedure bracket uh, is to somewhat miss the point, really. Um, you know, somebody going into court and dealing with one of these things needs an instrument, and I would submit it's far easier to have a single document doing that than something shoehorned into the 1995 Act where it doesn't properly belong. Right, thank you. I think that's a very simple explanation. It does, however, beg one question, which is whether the uh, 1995 Act needs some consolidation. I appreciate that's out of left field, but your view... Well, it, what you just said does rather imply that it, it, it might be in a less than perfect state. I, I don't think it's controversial to say that the 95 Act could do with, uh, if not consolidation, um, perhaps splitting out into smaller statutes. The Criminal Justice Bill before the Parliament at the moment already does that to some extent. We're taking yep. a lot of the police investigatory powers out of Part 2. They will now sit freestanding in the Criminal Justice Act Part 1, as it hopefully, assuming approved by the Parliament, will become. Um, so there is a process of almost deconsolidation Thank you. Uh, that's always helpful just to explore these things when we have the, the opportunity. Thank you. Stuart, Christian. Um, I think this is the last bit. And I suppose, suppose the issue really is that we've, we've ended up with something which is reasonably satisfactory insofar 
as the Parliament has been engaged in this issue with sufficient notice and the government has provided draft instruments in a non-legal draft sense um, to, to enable Parliament to do that and Parliament has had the opportunity to express its view on the whole subject in advance of the, of the relevant date. Um, albeit the mechanisms are ones which are that word hated by so many civil servants, novel. Um, if, of course, the Spaniards had decided to take their decision for the sake of argument at midday on the 30th of November for operation the following day, we'd clearly be in a less satisfactory position in terms of Parliament's engagement. In the bill. And it'd create problems for the government. And I suppose the question is... How likely is this to happen again in this kind of way? And that may be unanswerable. I can work out probably why. But more to the point, are there steps we could take or others could take that would enable us to have certainty to enable us to act and consider and decide in advance of our having powers in this narrow con kind of context, not in the generality? I think, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the answer to the question, how likely is this to happen again, I think is pretty unlikely. I think we're dealing with a pretty unlikely set of circumstances. You know, if I'm being honest, it, it's been a challenge for us to, to, to sort of to draft these proposals and also to give Parliament the kind of sort of service that we're, we're supposed to, to give you. Um, I'm sure if you asked my Cabinet Secretary that question, he would probably give you an answer about having, a, you, know, a, a, you know, the right to direct representation in the EU. And that would be one way of of, of, it, of it playing out differently, um, but you know I don't I don't I, I, you know I, I think it's a pretty unlikely set of circumstances, and I think going forward, you know we have you know the, the relationships in Scotland to do this to do this work uh, quickly and effectively, and we have the relationships with UK and EU counterparts uh, to, to, to 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 implement uh, all of Scotland's EU obligations. But it, but it is fair for me to say if the Spaniards, as they could have done, uh, because in Europe there is a history of moving right up to midnight and stopping the clock, and this could have been, hasn't been, but could have been such a circumstance, we might be in a less comfortable place. Well, I mean, with these measures, all that would have happened is we wouldn't have been participating in them until an agreement was reached. Obviously, the discussion around the European arrest warrant is a slightly different one, and not one that we're probably able to go into too much detail on, but that, that has been the sort of focus um, in the, the UK Parliament. So, so we wouldn't be in the position we now are unless there had been an initial yeah. all-member state agreement. Um, is that what you said? A lot of it, I think, a lot of it comes down to how the opt-in was negotiated and the difference between the Schengen and the non-Schengen measures. Um, and we've tried. We've sort of set out the difference in correspondence with the, the committee. So hopefully you can. That will save me from attempting to try to explain it again. Um, the non-Schengen ones are generally the ones that are reserved. Sorry, the Schengen ones are the ones that are reserved. So that um, you know, again, if you're asking me about the sort of risk to Scotland, you know, that clearly these are measures that that that, that aren't. Um, uh, you know, uh, operational in Scotland at the moment, but. Um I, mean, I, I think also it's it's fairly unique this um, five-year transitional period um, following the Lisbon Treaty. That, that I think that's a bit of a one-off, and and it, you know, we, we, this first of December date is at the end of the five-year period, and everything's happening at once. It, it's it's a fairly unique set of circumstances. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, convener. I, I mean, I accept everything you say about this being unique, unusual, rare. Um, and in this <coughs> circumstance, I think happily the committee are content with the negative procedure. But could circumstances arise, however rarely, in the future, where um, we find ourselves in this position, but where the committee would otherwise recommend an affirmative or even super-affirmative procedure because of the nature of some future instrument that comes before the committee? It's 
possible, and that's where maybe th that would be the opportunity to explore further this reading of the, the, the powers in the, in the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Act, you know, which was mentioned earlier, where you know, we think that there is, there is an argument that um, an affirmative instrument could be laid formally for scrutiny ahead of ministers gaining the power to make that instrument. So that, that's a possibility that in, 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 if a future circumstance were to arise that was anything like this at all, we, we would explore that further and, and see if you know, the, the parliament was comfortable with us taking that approach. I think, I think we also you know, decided that it was important for us to do Scottish regulations for, for these measures um, as well to give us a bit more I guess a bit more flexibility in how we how we develop them and, and, and how we engage with the Parliament on them. I think that has been beneficial for us and I hope it's been helpful for you as well. Now, if I could just follow up, that's a very interesting thought from Miss Scott that um, you know consideration has been given to that. Are there any other possibilities? Um, you know, that's one possibility. Have any other uh, occurred to you? No, I'd have to say no, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the I think there is an argument that affirmative could have could have been done in even in this case, and that's something to pursue further uh, for the future. The, the, the committee have had some uh, discussion about the possibility of some kind of super negative procedure. Um, is that something that could provide a remedy? I, without understand, I'm not sure if I, I understand exactly what uh, what's envisaged there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been involved in some discussions with this committee about super affirmative procedure. I'm very happy to defer to Mr. Fitzpatrick's office and, and come back to the committee if that's helpful on that point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, could, could I just just uh, observe? I think su uh, the, what, whatever a super negative procedure might be in other people's minds, I think it's probably pretty close to exactly what we're doing, <laughs> which is. You know, you're laying a, an instrument, uh, sorry, not laying an instrument, but producing an instrument which everybody can have a look at and have a discussion about and then going through the negative procedure when we get there. Uh, but clearly we, we may give that some made more detailed thought. Um, Stuart, do you? I just wanted to ask uh, Catherine Scott if the process by which we might lay stronger foundations to the use of the affirmative procedure in advance of the powers being available. Is, is that something that could be done via the government uh, uh, going to court and seeking a declarator? Or what other mechanism would be likely to be the one that might get us to that point? You know, to remove or, or, or mm. substantially mitigate the doubt. I mean, that's something that could be considered in the consequence of further discussion. I'd, I wouldn't necessarily be recommending that myself. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think, John. Um, forgive me, convener, but <clears throat> in, the res in this respect and on the edges of existing legislation, I mean, if there are, and since we deal with the minutia of legislation and the enablement of it, if there are things that you, having been through this experience, feel that um, we, the Parliament, um, could benefit from in terms of our process, you might wish to, to write to us, to, to point out to us from your viewpoint um, if there is an enhancement in terms of procedure that we could adopt. I mean, I appreciate you. Obviously, that would be a matter for the government minister as well, Mr. Fitzpatrick, office. But we too would be interested if this anomalous situation in which we find ourselves, um, there's a, a, a development to be taken from it. Very happy to take that away and feed it back to ministers. I think, I mean, what I think what what is to us is also the value of the kind of non formal engagement. You know, picking up with with Ewan and his team and and and, and the, the lawyers as well has been hugely valuable. You know, the way we've tried to develop it is with our kind of operational group, but the way in a way the way we've tried to sort of sort of manage the SG uh, SP bit has been done. You know, through through that kind of discussion. And yeah, I think there's lots we can learn. And, maybe not even for the, the sort of extremely novel cases like this. Right, Thank I you. think that concludes questions. Could I just 
Thank you for being here. Could I also thank you for precisely what you've just spoken about, because I don't think there's actually any criticism of the process that we have been through over the last few weeks to try and make this. It does seem to have been the best, and it's been, I think, very effective on all sides. So we thank you for that. But clearly, if there are any thoughts about how we might deal with this or similar kind of things in the future, we'd always be willing to hear that. Processes are the things we worry about. It is surprising how often we seem to have found ourselves with unique sets of circumstances. Um, and that's not a criticism, again, of today, but it does seem to turn up quite often on this desk. So grateful for your uh, advice and contribution this morning. Thank you. I uh, will suspend just briefly while we reorganize. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to agenda item three, which is instruments subject to affirmative procedure. <coughs> no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Public Water Supply Scotland Regulations 2014 draft. Is the committee content with this instrument, please? Thank you. Agenda item four, instruments subject to negative procedure, the Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Monitoring Committees, Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014-281. There is a lack of consistency in the terms of Articles 3, 5 and 4, 6, notwithstanding that the two provisions are intended to give the same effect. Further to this, Article 47 has been drafted in a way which does not accurately give effect to the policy intention by going beyond what is required to achieve that intention. Well, the drafting may not impede delivery of the intended policy intention as it ensures that staff on the body to whom the integration functions are delegated are represented on an integration joint monitoring committee. It makes provision which goes beyond what is required to achieve that intention, providing that additional staff also may be represented. In light of these issues, does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground? Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Scotland Order 2014 SSI 2014 285. A few points have been raised by our legal advisers in relation to this instrument. Firstly, Article 3.1d and 5.2d provide that when an integration joint board is established, it must include the Chief Officer of the Integration Joint Board. Section 10 of the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014 provides, however, that the Chief Officer is to be appointed by the Integration Joint Board once the board is established. It would accordingly not appear to be possible for the Chief Officer to be a member of the Integration Joint Board as established, as that officer is not appointed until after the board is established. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the Parliament's attention under reporting ground I, as Articles 3.1d and 5.2d appear to be defectively drafted? Secondly, Article 3.3 makes provision for establishing the number of persons to be appointed under Paragraph 1a and b. The Scottish Government intends this to mean the number of persons appointed under each of Paragraphs 1a and 1b. However, the Committee may consider that the manner in which Article 3.3 is worded does not act in it accurately reflect that intention. The drafting as it stands could readily support the interpretation that the intention is for Article 3.3 to refer to the total number of persons appointed under paragraphs 1a and b together. The committee may consider the Article 3.3 could have been drafted in such a manner as to put the matter beyond doubt. Does the committee therefore agree to, to draw the instrument to the Parliament's attention under reporting ground H as the meaning of Article 3.3 could be clearer? 
Finally, there's a lack of consistency between the wording of Articles 3.6 and 5.6, notwithstanding the fact that the provisions are intended to have the same effect. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the Parliament's attention under the general reporting ground? Mike. I, I think it's worth uh, putting on record the, the, you know, the, the, the following point, and it's that um, these things, albeit that they don't seem to have huge importance in themselves, I think um, the whole matter of clear drafting is not just a matter of elegance for its own sake, but it's a matter of efficiency, because uh, when instruments are less clear than they ought to be, or possibly even ambiguous, it consumes resource. It consumes resource of perhaps lawyers, multiple lawyers, pondering over the meaning when, in fact, if the meaning was clear, they could get on more quickly and efficiently. So I, I, I wanted just to make that point, that this is not just a mere matter of semantics. I think the point is well made, and I'm sure we would all agree. Thank you for that. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Teachers' Pension Scheme, Scotland No. 2, Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, 292, nor on the South Arrow Marine Conservation Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014, 297, nor on the Discretionary Housing Payments Limit on Total Expenditure, Revocation Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014, 298. Is the committee content with those instruments, please? Agenda item five, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Act of Sedarent Rules of the Court of Session and Sheriff Court Rules Amendment number two, SSI 2014-291. Is the committee content with that then, please? Thank you. Uh, that concludes the public part of this meeting. Thank you.